Hello lovely people, welcome to our podcast Trans Identities and the Story of Kiderogali in National Socialism. My name is Yami. And my name is Victoria. Today we're going to discuss what being trans was like in National Socialism. And for that we are going to focus on the life of Kiderogali. Yes, our podcast will be divided into three parts, where each part will be touching different periods of time, pre-war time, interwar time, and a little bit of a modern look at the end. And now we're going to get right into it. In this section, Victoria is going to explain how someone could be registered as a trans person in the interwar period, and I'll have a look at the prep prosecuted life of Kita. Just as a heads up, I will be using the word transvestite in order to describe trans people. It was the German term to officially describe trans identities. Of course, now the term is not seen that way anymore, but I will still be using it in its right historical context and in order to factually describe the people for you. For that, I believe it's important to explain to you who Magnus Hirschfeld was. He was the most famous scientist and sexual reformist back then, and most importantly, he was the one who was handing out the transvestite licenses. In addition to that, the term transvestite was from his size used to officially diagnose trans people, so it was also a medical term. In 1919, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld founded the Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin, which basically became a center of homosexual movements. The institute was focused on conducting research and treatment on a variety of matters regarding sexuality and gender. And worth to add was that it was also taking care of the treatment for venereal diseases, sexual counseling and marriage. Yes, the Institute for Sexual Science was involved in preparing of expert reports for trials that were focused on official changes of gender and names of intersex persons. It was also responsible for providing um, transvestite license. There were official doctor certificates stating that for certain patients' mental health, health and well-being, they were now officially transvestite and are allowed to, for example, wear women's clothing. This essentially was really important for encounters with the police. Under paragraph 175, men who are having intimate relations with men could be prosecuted. This also applied to trans women who are biologically male. And two applied to public indecencies. But with this certificate, they were able to prove that they were in fact not being publicly indecent and allowed to wear women's clothing. This was also very important in the context of prostitution, since men were not allowed to be prostitutes and sometimes use women's clothing as a disguise. And with the transvestite certificate, they could distinguish themselves from them. It is also worth noting that Hirschfeld saw transness as a part of someone's character and identity. And one of the people who received this certificate was Keto Bogali. Kita was born on September 17, 1903 in Berlin, and as far as we know, she was the only person identified as female who was registered under the transvestite category at Sachsenhausen concentration camp. But before jumping straight into the prosecuted part of her story, let's have a look into her life before she was imprisoned. She was kicked out by her parents at a young age because she did not identify with the male gender. Throughout her life, she would have often been mistaken to be a girl in men's clothing, which, of course, led Kita to experience discrimination. But we think that she must have probably also felt some kind of gender euphoria from that. Of course, this is just our assumption, but we think it's definitely worth thinking about that. This might have been the start of when Kita realized that she was a trans woman. She worked as a technical designer and a precision mechanic, which was a male-dominated field, so you can probably imagine how it must have been for her. Despite all of that, she kept being herself and expressed her truthful identity as a woman. In 1920s, she received her transvestite license after getting in touch with Magnus Hirschfeld. Unfortunately, after Hitler came to power in 1933, prosecution against queer people conducted by Nazi officers only got stronger. In this section, we would like to focus on the prosecution of trans identities under the Nazi regime. 
There is really no data that would provide specific information on the situation of transvestite people at the concentration camps. In Germany, there was no law that would be used to sentence lesbian women. People believe that women can be re-educated. Uh, lesbian women, along with people who didn't identify as their assigned gender at birth, were denounced, their houses would be searched, police would investigate them. If within investigation other things appear like social deviants, they would face repression and, in the worst case, be sent to concentration camps. What we can say is that about 5,000 to 10,000 men were sent to them because of their homosexuality, under paragraph 175. Between 1940 and 1945, the proportion of homosexuals in the concentration camp was a bit more than 1% of all inmates. And speaking a bit more about lesbian women, if they happen to be sent to concentration camps, were registered under the anti-social category, with some examples we've added lesbian next to the category. Uh, because of that, it's really hard to tell how many lesbian women were sent to concentration camps because of their sexual orientation. Now mentioning trans people, it was a bit different. Most of the trans people were not prosecuted under the paragraph of 175, but under the paragraph of 185, the cause of public indecency, which I talked about earlier. They were then forced to stop living as their own chosen self and had to wear clothing for their biological gender. Focusing now on Kitty Rogali, in May 27, 1947, she was sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp as a consequence of wearing women's clothing. As I previously mentioned, she was the only self-identifying female prisoner registered under the transvestite category. What is also very important to mention is that of course when she arrived at a concentration camp, her transvestite certificate was annulled, but after a short while she, quote, proved herself, end quote, to the Nazi officers with her hard work. Since she was a very skilled worker from working as a precision mechanic and the Nazi officers valued her labor and precision. And thus she actually got her transvestite certificate back and was then registered as a transvestite. In 1938, she was taken to the court and sentenced for two more years of forced labor. Within the time of her imprisonment, she lost custody over her children she had with her girlfriend, Gertrude. In 1940, she was released from the prison and was able to come back to living in Berlin. But then in 1941, she was captured again. Following a decision made by the court, her sanity was denied and Kata was forcibly sent to Wittenau Sanatorium, which was taking part in the T4 action. That shortly explaining was a campaign provided by doctors at psychiatric institutions to mass murder by providing involuntary euthanasia. Unfortunately, Kita spent her last two years of her life in the set sanatorium until she hanged herself in one of the toilets on April 11, 1943. There are some uncertain details that lead to assumption on how she died. According to some medical records, doctors working with Kita stated that she was not making any progress to be cured and therapy and treatment weren't effective in her case. So those information create a bit of a room to wonder if Kita actually committed a suicide or maybe she died under different circumstances. We are now slowly approaching the end of our podcast. We don't want to end this podcast on a sad note. What is really worth mentioning in terms of commemorating Kita's story is that she was the first trans person who was commemorated with a Stolperstein with her real name engraved on it, instead of the one she was given at birth, in other words, her dead name. Uh, we hope that there will be more opportunities to provide research on specifically trans people that will help with commemorating them and bringing their stories closer to the scene of the prosecution of queer people. Overall, trans people are a really valuable and an incredibly meaningful part of the history of LGBTQ plus rights. One must not forget who threw the first stone at Stonewall. It was a trans woman after all. They have shaped and in a way cared for a lot of communities for the LGBTQ plus people. They are truly appreciated and we must bring more light to their amazing identities and thus shed light to the incredible and strong woman that Kato Rogali was. Thank you guys for listening to our little project and we hope we are able to bring some knowledge to you all on what the situation of trans people look like during national socialism by providing an example with Kita's story. Thank you again for listening and we really, really appreciate it. You can also check out the other podcast that is about trans identities and also features Kato Rogali. Goodbye. Bye. This podcast episode was recorded as part of the Summer School Remembrance Podcast Prosecution of Queer People Under National Socialism, organized by Deutsche Gesellschaft EV and GFPS Polska. The project is funded by the EVZ Foundation and the Federal Foreign Office as part of the program Young People Remember.